My tummy's a grumbling for some juicy movies. Oh, is that what that was? <laughs> that was, yeah, that yeah. was my stomach grumbling for ju- juicy films. I hope the mic picked up your stomach. I doubt it did. I, I let just, like, amplify it to the very max. <laughs> That's the intro, like, theme. We make a song out of it. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna address this. I accidentally just said stomach. I, I'm sure someone would have noticed. <laughs> stomach. No, that's what that's the that's the term now. We changed it. Yeah, this is it's the twenty first century, guys. We're about twenty years deep. I think it's time to stop calling them stomachs and start calling them stomachs. Okay, with that, hey everybody. I'm London. I'm Thomas. Welcome back to Weencast, uh, the show with the weens where we cast. We cast Dota, right? Sure. I got a I got a spicy chicken sandwich next to me. I got a monster in front of me. It's currently eight ten in the morning. We just got off of work and we're ready to talk about fucking the gulag. Yeah. Wait, were we supposed to watch the gulag? Because I didn't watch that one. Yeah. No. <laughs> so we did watch. If you tuned in to last episode, we chose. My Girl, and the other one was... The World of Conoco. So, shortly, we're going to be talking about both of those. Probably starting with the older one first. But first, Thomas, seen any good movies lately? Any Anything else that we haven't seen together? Uh, no. Wait. Did, let me check my fucking letterbox. I want to say I watched a movie... That wasn't on our list at home this week, but I, for the fucking life of me, can't remember what it was. Uh, Sweet. Uh, I've seen a couple good ones. Um, We have a weekly movie day. We watched uh, Black Cinema this week. Yeah. We watched fucking Boys in the Hood, and I had never seen it. And I had been meaning to since my boy John Singleton died a couple months ago. R.I.P. But that was really good. I really enjoyed that one. Um, oh, that night, after you left, we watched They Live. Oh, the John Carpenter one? Yeah, I got my buddy Joe. I made a list on Letterboxd for him. Of, it's called, it's called, it's just his name and then the, uh, the agenda. See, and it's just a bunch of movies that he hasn't seen. Because he hasn't seen so many things from like the 80s and 90s, 70s. Yeah, like, and I haven't seen and they really they iconic them. movies, too. Like, he just watched, uh, Gremlins was on that list. Yeah, he we just watched, watched Gremlins, that. and they live on those lists now. But, like, I also have, like, the original Dracula, original Frankenstein, Citizen Kane, The Warriors, which I fucking love. Have you seen that one? I've seen clips from it, oh, but I haven't great. seen the movie. It's a great movie. Um, yeah, I know that there's, like, the famous, like, uh, clanking of the bottles on the fingers. Warriors come out in the <laughs> Uh... Is the PS2 game for that good? I uh, it's it's made by fucking Rockstar. Okay, which is really funny. Um, it's pretty good. Um, yeah. Me and Joe actually played it. He's never seen the movie, but I think him, him and me played it once. I want to say it's it's, it's PS4. Good. Uh, store. Oh, it's got a PS4 release. Yeah, oh, it's sweet. one of the few PS2 games that. Oh well, no, I'm released. buying after you leave. <laughs> Now they just need to fucking put King Con on there, and uh, they've got a solid. Oh my album. god! Let's talk. Well, this is now the podcast where we talk about the best movie tie-in video game, King Kong. Fucking, I'm thinking about pulling out my PS2 and playing that because I really de- so desperately want to get that ending where King Kong lives. Because if you, if you like beat the game and do like a certain amount of things so many times. Uh, you unlock that alternate ending where... Is that true? I didn't know that. Yeah, that's a thing That's a thing with the game. And what the fuck? That's like my favorite movie, and it makes me sad every time what I watch it. What about the podcast where I eat food while we talk? <laughs> it's okay. I, I'm here to enunciate. I'm hungry. The person who's terrible at enunciation. Uh, so, let's see. But They Live was great. I really, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I, was, I, I had watched it a long time ago, and I like remember nothing. I don't. Funny enough, I don't think Joe enjoyed it very much. See, I watched. It's so fucking goofy. It's yeah. so goofy. I remember it being kind of goofy. I watched it probably when I was like eleven or twelve. I bought it on Blu-ray just recently mm. because I, I was kind of in the same boat. I am in the same boat that you were in, where 
I don't really remember the movie too much. Like, I do. I remember he finds, like, the sunglasses, and I remember, like, the 12-minute did... fucking fight scene. Like, I remember stuff like that, but a lot of the... Like... I didn't realize. I had forgotten how long it takes him for him to, like, actually put the sunglasses on. It's, like, half an hour into the film. And I assumed hmm. it was, like, ten minutes in. Huh. Yeah, no, I... I don't... Yeah, I... I don't remember, like, jack shit about the structure of the film. I but, just... Yeah, I've been meaning to watch Mark Carpenter films, because I was actually thinking about this, and when I think of, like, these big figures of, like, cinema, especially with, like, horror films, you think of, like, Wes Craven, and we were talking the other day about how Wes Craven, for the most part, makes bad films, like, which is fine, he's made some really, he made some really good ones, but then I was looking at John Carpenter, and for the most part, he makes, like, pretty, like, universally, like, well received yeah, films. I'd like, say like eighty percent of his yeah. movies are, which is like really good in yeah. my opinion. Like if you especially since he makes a yeah, lot, he's of them made too. like twenty seven or something. And even like, have you seen? Is it the Ghost, Ghost of, of Mars? Mars? Yeah, I saw it when I I saw I really like twenty minutes it of it because I, I feel like, like I'd be one of the few that would enjoy. I remember turning it on and just turning it off after like fifteen minutes. From everyone that I've spoken to that does enjoy the film, they say that, like, you have to go into it thinking that it's, like, a B-movie, just with a bigger budget. Yeah, I can get behind that. Like, I I like B-movies. Uh, like Jerry Seinfeld, right? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, totally. I, I hate that... I hate that I can't call them B-movies anymore without that coming up and just me being like, oh, yep. So, have you seen that one? B movie with Jerry Seinfeld? Yeah. Yes. Are you a fan? I mean, he fucks the woman. I think it's got some funny jokes sprinkled in there. Remember the guy's face, the meme? Ooh. What? I don't know. <laughs> I, I I don't remember that. Uh, I try to keep up with the kids. I I try to stay away from memes. Well, I don't try no, to... me too. I try to... I don't oh. go on Facebook, which is, like, the big hub for, like, where I see most of my memes. Ah. I was gonna say, before I got sidetracked with B-movie, um, but I, w- I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, Wes Craven, John Carpenter, and usually when I think of them, I also think of Ridley Scott, because of, like, Alien. Um, Ridley? And Ridley Scott, I think, is probably right in between them. I think... I would say probably like 60% of this film. I think Ridley Scott is Sucks. a really good director like in terms of translating what he has like his ideas whether it be from someone else's script onto the screen or uh, like he he's really good like his movies are always like very visually impressive uh, but god damn does he have some horribly written fucking movies sometimes. He, that... I, I've... And are you I've talking been... about, like, purely, like, horror icon? Because I wouldn't traditionally think. I I think of him as one of those, like, people that, like, starts in horror, but eventually branched out. Well, that's what I... That's also how I see, like, John Carpenter in a lot of ways, too. That, that's true. Because, I mean... Because I wouldn't... Not, I, I don't think really anyone... classify They Live as a horror movie, either. No, like, but it's definitely got, like, the elements yeah, in there. Yeah, but, like, even, like, the escape movies. That yeah. Movie, though, that's not a horror the, movie. Those are more action. Um, but I... But Wes Craven, I... It's just, like, in my head, they're inherently connected with me because I always got them confused when I was a kid. By John Carpenter, Wes John Craven. Carpenter, Wes Craven, and Ridley Scott. I'm just like, ah, hmm. old man... Old man! I I guess they kind of look alike. They're old white men. Well, and I, I hadn't seen any of these movies either, like Alien. And when I was a kid, I was stupid. So I'm just like, yeah, all horror movies are probably made by the same guy. <laughs> this was when I was like six. Okay. I was like, yeah. Right after I figured out that movies weren't real life. That was, I was like, What? What do you mean? What do you mean Elmo's not real? See, uh, that 
was a shock. <laughs> my, I don't know, like, what age I was when my parents had to sit down with me. Uh, it, it's, like, out of my head. Like, I have no idea what age I was, but I know I would have had to have been really young. Because I have, they've been, sh- they were just like, alright, what can we do to get this kid, like, to shut up and sit down and just leave us alone for large periods of time? He likes horror movies. Let's show him horror movies. And then, of course, I never had, like, the problem of, like, nightmares or anything because they sat me down and, like, you realize, like, everything here is made by somebody. Like, no- nobody's really dying right on the screen. None of the danger. Ghosts and... And then they, like, snuck in a snuff film. film. Huh? And then they snuck in a snuff film. It no, made you watch an actual person but die. But they made the mistake of telling me what Faces of Death was when I was like 11. Because I'm like, well, it's not like they're like, hey, you know what? You should watch Faces of Death. I was like, are there any movies where like people actually die? And my, I think it was my dad who told me, he's like, oh, Faces of Death. But obviously this is like back before like they were super aware of how easy it was to find shit on the internet. So, I, they were probably like, eh, whatever, if we don't buy it for him, he won't fucking find it. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I'm sorry, Faces of Death just really tried Sorry, we just watched Faces of Death in that <laughs> last split second. Uh, welcome back. We had a, a plumbing issue. <laughs> I poop my pants. It was pretty messy. We have to alternate which one of us poops our pants each episode. You did it the first, I did it the second. Yeah. Anyway, so we went on our little tangent about Ridley Scott and uh, all that jazz. You want to move on to our uh, next segment? Where, uh, where we, the game show segment? I don't know about a game show segment, but uh, the pitch segment? Oh, yeah. Fuck, I forgot. About and that's fine. Okay, yeah, go ahead. What are we doing? Okay. So, basically, I thought it'd be a fun idea to just try pitching a movie that'll never be made. Just unless every, we make it. Every episode. Yeah, unless we make it. Uh, Have you been thinking about this? Yeah, I had, like, a... Okay. I'm gonna... You say your pitch idea, and then I'm gonna come up with one right now, because I forgot about this. Okay. Uh, so... I totally forgot, but I'm gonna come up with one right now. All right. Takes place, the year is 2020, because I want to give a little wiggle room between now and when the film's, you know, starts. Potential production. Uh, (laughs) So, it basically... Oh, God, how do I... Okay, so a bunch of uh, celebrities are dying at the beginning of the year, you know how it usually goes. Everyone's like, oh gosh, so many celebrities are dying this year. Because uh, I've just noticed people tend to say that uh, at the beginning of every goddamn year. It's like death is a constant or something, I don't know. But uh, basically, all the freshly deceased celebrities start attacking Hollywood as giant kaijus. <laughs> And, uh, so they bring... Excuse me? Yes. So, yeah, let's say, like... Pacific Rim 3? I mean, it's not... I mean, there are more kaiju movies than uh, Pacific Rim, my friend. The Host 2? Uh, well, okay. It's funny that you mentioned The Host. Is Song Kang Ho starring? Yeah. So, basically, uh... He's over in America because Bon Joon Ho is making another movie Snow for Netflix. Snowpiercer two, not Snowpiercer two, some something else. Folk to two, uh, and uh, basically, Song Kang Ho uh, finds like this like Ultraman suit, and so in the movie he plays himself. Yes, but he's becomes a superhero. I'm 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 in. I'm in. <laughs> I'm definitely a, in. He's got to fight all these. Uh, Giant dead celebrities. Incredible. Yeah. Just the stupid little idea I had, and I was like, oh, that would be a weird fucking movie. (laughs) I'm going to pitch it on the podcast. And here we are. 
Okay. Uh, I don't know what, like, the act structure would be. Like, uh, prob- probably just basic, you know, three-act structure. Uh, Twelve act. Yeah. <laughs> fucking a 27-act magnum opus. <laughs> the first seven acts are him eating a sandwich. No, the first seven acts are him eating seven different kinds of sandwiches. But, it, no, it's like one sandwich, but each part is a different sandwich that they, like, glued together. Oh. With, like, food glue. With food glue. <laughs> 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 Whatever they use to adhesive food. Food glue? I... Flu? You know, I'm... Um, I don't know what they typically use for that. Icing. Like, for cakes and stuff, I'd probably think icing. I'm sure... Maybe just peanut butter. I get... I'm trying to think of, like, dishes that need to be, like, glued together. Like, maybe, like, a... Like, if someone built, like, a fucking cathedral of hot dogs or something? I don't know. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Are you ready for my idea? Yeah, what's your idea for a movie? So... This takes place in uh, probably about 30 to 40 years from now. And it is about the first human test subject. There's a new, like, it's supposed to be a cure for death. It's this serum that grants pretty much immortality. And somebody takes it and he, he, it works. Like, he becomes immortal, pretty much. And then uh, a bunch of other people take it, and they all die. Like, he's the only one that survives. So this drug is outlawed. And it's the production is gone, and he's the only person that's immortal. And people think, like, it's, it's like this witch hunt-like dynamic, and they're like, oh, this guy... There's something wrong with him. Like he, so he gets exiled from society, pretty much. And it's this story over like a thousand years of like this hermit living in like just wandering, living and interacting with these humans as they like evolve and then eventually devolve. And he's just. This constant, he was literally just like this regular Joe Schmo that was doing these like clinical trials, and how he's like the this immortal figure who's like in these myths, and how like myths are created and shit. Hmm. That's my weird idea. I just came up with. Make that movie. Well, there you go. Uh, anyone listening? There were two uh, very fresh and very salty movie ideas, just like uh, your local movie theater popcorn. Uh, okay, uh, so, you just want to dive into My Hero? Well, she's too young, so no. Got him. Fucking pedophile. Okay, so we're going to talk about My Girl first, which was Thomas's pick. Yeah. uh, So we'll talk about it for a little bit, and then we'll dive into spoilers for it, or... We're going to die on spoilers straight away. Uh, we should probably just slap the spoiler warning on there. Spoilers! Uh, if you haven't seen My Girl, go watch it, or don't, but you'll be spoiled. Yeah, so. if, if you want to know our general opinions on it real quick, before we actually talk about the movie. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a movie, I guess. Nice. I thought it was kind of bad. I... Thomas gave it a 10 out of 10. It's his favorite film. Okay, a little backstory with my experience of this movie. He's Macaulay Culkin. Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, my grandparents showed me this movie when I was, like, nine. And I really liked it when I was a kid. I haven't, like, watched it since then, so I wanted to see if it held up. Because I, I remember, like, really liking it. And I really like the idea of this movie. 
but the execution just, I don't know, wasn't quite there. Could have. I'm interested to dive more into this, because I want to know what about the idea of the film is enticing. Like, a movie that's aimed at, like, families uh, and, like, young younger audiences. <laughs> With Eddie Murphy. <laughs> yeah. Like, when I was, like, fucking four. We should have watched that. <laughs> I guess, but... Uh, <laughs> that, like really deals with the subject of death and like learning to kind of like cope with it and go through like the different stages uh I feel you. like i i like that idea okay and i like i remember like the setup for the movie like you know this little girl lives in this like funeral parlor slash morgue uh with her dysfunctional family and you know it sounds like a good idea on paper but just the execution was kind of generic. Kind of hit all the main story beats that you would assume it would. Uh, but would you say you still enjoyed it this time around? I would say... I Or like pretty middle of the road. Pretty, pretty middle of the road. There are still aspects that I enjoy about the movie. But overall... It left a much more sour taste in my mouth than when I was younger, and that might also just be because uh, you're old. I'm old now, and I'm also uh, atheist now. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, you? You're an atheist? Surprisingly, yes. What? I thought you were a theist. <laughs> Too bad they can't just get my, like, deadpan stare <laughs> through the audio. They can, I mean, they can, hear, they the can hear it. They can hear the stare. Okay, so with that, we'll dive in a little more. Uh, let's talk about the structure of the film, I guess. Uh, how the fuck does the film open? Uh, the film opens with the opening line, which was originally supposed to be the title for the film. I was born jaundiced. That was supposed to be the opening. That was supposed to be the title. Yeah, of the, the film. title for the movie was I originally was born spoke. jaundiced. Yep, that's. And apparently, the studio mm-hmm. held a five hundred dollar reward for anyone who could think of a better title. And apparently, Literally anything. Yeah, <laughs> that because that has nothing to do with anything else in the film and doesn't connect with any except that she like. The main character is a hypochondriac because her mother's dead. Yeah. And she lives in a funeral home. So anytime anyone dies from anything, she thinks she gets it. And fun fact. Like, is that is that why I was called I was born John? So why not I what I I don't know why they Why didn't that? they Did I Kill My Mother? Uh, that would have been a be- much better title. I don't know if that, that would have been a little too heavy, I think. Uh fun fact. I was born I, I had jaundice when I was a baby. I think I have jaundice now. Like I think you are looking a little on the yellow side. Uh, there I have some weird like condition. I can't remember what it's called. But it like one of the side effects one of the side effects is great. One of the side effects is like I'm it's super hard for me to like have heart disease. Like I probably will never get a heart disease because of it. Well, that's and, pretty cool. Uh and that I have slight jaundice. So, well, I had jaundice Sweet. as a baby, and, I and got, you're gonna have heart disease and die. So, oh yeah, for sure. Like I wasn't yeah, able to so take my was born jaundice medicine when I was a kid because they were like, "Yeah, dude, your heart's gonna explode if you keep taking this shit." I'm like, "Oh, okay, I'll just be ADHD off meds then." So the main plot of the film revolves around uh, fucking her name's Veda Solfenstein. Right? Yeah, something, something like that. that. <laughs> I wrote it down because I'm like, what kind there, of... It's <laughs> like one scene that made me really laugh where she fucking like tells her name to uh, fucking to Jamie Lee Curtis's his ex. Uh, ex yeah. And he's like, yikes. <laughs> She's like, I like my name. <laughs> yes. Uh, Sultanfuss. 
Sultan. Veda Sultan. One of my first notes on the film. What kind of fucking name is Veda? <laughs> Not I got even... a chicken bone stuck in my throat. My oh, name is yes. Veda Sultan. So they live in a funeral home. Are they they he uh her father Dan Aykroyd is yes. a mortician, um, and prepares bodies and then has hosts funerals in his home and stuff like that. And there's a bunch of coffins like in one of her rooms. And at the beginning of the movie, she has a bunch of boys around her and she's like, "Pay me and I'll show you it." And I remember I, my first note was like, I legitimately thought she was gonna show them her boobs, like. Like that's because they were talking about breasts literally right before, and I'm like, "What the fuck is?" Oh happening? yeah, because like, she has I, that I, line like where she's like, "My left breast is developing significantly faster." Yeah, than my so right I breast. assume like I'm like, "Oh, this is fucking weird," but okay. But then she leads him into a, the like room with all the coffins, and she opens one, and the there's no body, and she's just like, "Uh oh, sometimes they're not fully dead when they get here." And she points to her fucking grandma in a rocking chair who's, like, senile and has dementia. Yeah. And, <laughs> and they're, like, they're, like, running out. They're like, ah! Uh, oh, and then I wrote, the track record on movies about morticians is not very good. Because the only one, the only other one I could think of is like, ah, the autopsy of Jane Doe. Oh, that, that and honestly, like, and I know, Doe. um, there was another movie, uh, The Possession of Hannah Grace came out last year, I think. Or beginning of this year, maybe. And I think that was about a mortician also, and that looked abysmal. And I, I, I walked in, because so I was working at a theater at the time, I walked in a couple of times, I'm like, holy shit, this is bad. I remember there was, like, this old Tales from the Crypt episode that, like, follows a bunch of kids spying on, like, a demented mortician and getting stuck in his morgue while he's in there. Actually, I want to say that... That was that was a pretty good little movie. Have you seen I Am like... Not a Serial Killer? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's with Christopher Lloyd. Um, oh, it's what? it's like Disturbia, actually, with Shia LaBeouf. Oh, um... This this kid, like, I think he's like a... Tr- it's been a while since I saw it. I, I remember enjoying it. But uh, it's about this, like, kid who's, like, I think a troublemaker. And he's, like, trying to convince people that, like, Christopher Lloyd is, like, a serial killer. And he's like, oh, I'm not a serial killer. He, he is. Well, that's non-spoilers. That's literally the basis of the movie. Um, hmm. And I th- want to say, I think he's a mortician's assistant. I think his dad's a mortician or something. And that's pretty good. So maybe I was wrong. But oh, yeah, that back to the movie. You'll see some good morgue stuff in uh, Return of the Living Dead, which we'll watch. Uh, which is my suggestion for the uh, what for the day? Not for not the, for like the podcast, but for oh yeah, movie. we're watching that for next movie day. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, yeah, the, the majority of that one takes place in a morgue, so it uh, it's not your conventional morgue movie, though. I guess, but what what is? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, did you pick up on all the intense foreshadowing surrounding the character of Thomas J? Like how he has your name? Well, I mean, how, out What? How, like, literally the first line is like, he's allergic to everything. Yeah. yeah. He's allergic to everything. There's, like, the kid's coffin. I... Spoiler, I know we're already talking about spoilers, but he will eventually die. Yeah, he dies in, like, the third act, end of the second act, whatever you want to fucking call that. Uh, Can't wait to talk about that. (laughs) Yeah, so... Um, One thing I want to talk about real quick is Veda as a character was probably my favorite part of the film. Yeah. I enjoyed her character, and I really like most of her dialogue. I like the bluntness. It seems like right at the edge of like this isn't what a kid would say. Like, yeah, there's, it, there are some scenes that I'm like, this doesn't make any sense for a child. Yeah, there's some like some lines of dialogue she has where it's like I could never see a fucking kid saying this, and then there are some lines that she has where I'm like, oh, I did say shit like that all the time. But actually, I wrote a note about this, and I want to talk about it real quick. I said that.
I said that I felt that the writing for Veda was a little all over the place. Sometimes it feels like she is written as like a 13 or 14 year old, and other times as someone who is like seven. And then I was thinking, I can't tell, because this, the film talks a lot about how she hasn't, like, she never really coped, and nobody really ever coped with the death of her mother during childbirth. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to figure out if the film was trying to convey that she had, like, had a weird childhood and had grown up in a lot of ways and it had not grown at all in others, or if the film was just bad. And I don't think the writing was good enough to say that it was the 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 former. Yeah. I think it was probably just bad writing. But yeah, this most is, of the writing between her. This, uh, the person who wrote the screenplay for this, uh, this is the first, uh, like, uh, screenplay that they had adapted. I don't know if it was necessarily the first screenplay they wrote. I'd imagine they probably wrote a couple drafts they, of it, uh, hopefully. Uh, no, it's some Christian one. I Wonder. had her. I had her name. Uh, but I don't have my laptop, which had that. She loves Reagan. Yeah, she does, according to like one of the final lines of the film. That is the worst final line of the film. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just like, oh my god. Because there are some points in the movie where, like, they have, like, that cheesy, patriotic, uh, like, tone to it. And, like, the going to church. And while I was watching it, I was like, is this supposed to be, like, ton and cheek? Because it, it is technically, like, a period piece. It takes place in the 70s, even though it was made in the 90s. I'm like, may- maybe that's, like, intentional. And then I went and I, like, read a couple of interviews with the author of the screenplay. Uh, she is very religious, so I don't think it was meant to be ton and cheek. Uh, uh, all seem pretty genuine. Uh, but who knows? Who knows? You know, I don't, I don't fucking know. I'm not, There's, I'm not that fucking woman. So, yeah. So, yeah, basically, the first act is setting up all the characters. and So, Dan Aykroyd's the dad, and then uh, Jamie Lee Curtis comes in. Yeah. And um, she's applying for a job as a beautician, but she doesn't realize it's for dead people. Yeah, but she needs well, the money. She, yeah, so she, she needs takes the money. The job. And he's like, you don't have a problem doing this with dead people? And she says the line, well... All of my previous clients will eventually die. <laughs> and, and, I, and I just, I don't know, I like that line. I thought it was, like, really stupid. But yeah. in a good way. Uh, there's another line where they're, like, at bingo later in the movie, and she's, like, looking at all the old people around her, and she's like, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be doing the makeup on some of these people really soon. And he, like, leans in, and he's like, I know. How do you think we got these seats? And it's just like, oh my god. <laughs> It's fucking stupid, but uh, so you have what was her name? Shelly, yeah, I think it was Shelly. Shelly, uh, Dan then, Aykroyd was what was that? Uh, then there's Dan Aykroyd's brother who, who uh, was the fucking worst. You know who he is, right? He plays uh, Clark in the thing, that dog oh. kennel guy. Oh, yeah, okay. He also plays a Stan. Adult Stanley in the uh, It miniseries. I mean, I don't even know. If, I wouldn't say when they really set up his character at all. He just kind of appears he, in like yeah, two he, scenes. He, he's Harry. Harry Sultanfuss. Yeah. He, uh, and then the brother's name was Phil Sultanfuss. So. Yeah. Uh, the character who I thought I remembered, like I'm like, oh, he's got he's a decent sized role is a. Uh, Dad Aykroyd's mortician friend, but he's only in, like, that, like, first scene, really. Yeah, and, and then like, I don't think... Is he in there's, there's any like, other yeah, scene? I think there's, like, there? two, but he, like, has, like, a line. Or, like, he's an extra. Yeah, like, I remember him being much more prominent in the movie. I'm like, oh, I guess not. But, and then Macaulay Culkin is uh, Veda's best friend. Thomas J. Thomas J. Senate, sorry. He is the Senate. Oh, great. Uh, Dude! They should make a Sheev Palpatine film. It's like him as a young a youngin, and it's Macaulay Culkin. He plays Sheev as like a 30 year old. <laughs> okay, I was like, what do you mean by youngin? Or youngin? Uh, yeah, they, they de-age him. <laughs> there we go. 
You can have that classic Macaulay Culkin back. Uh, he's I I like Macaulay Culkin. He's but he terrible is in, in this movie. movie. His I don't know if he was just at that point where he's like, yeah, I'm a famous child actor. I was in I Home mean, Alone. I don't really have to try that hard. Apparently, there is a huge uh, backlash against his character dying in this movie from all the hardcore like Macaulay Culkin fans. If I'm gonna be honest, I also like Macaulay Culkin. I think some of his child roles were good. But yeah. I don't think he was good in Home Alone. I think he was pretty bad. Yeah. Like, I think Home Alone in general is, like, I enjoy Home Alone, but it's kind of bad. Yeah, no. I, I, I agree with you there. Uh, but, like, I think he's really good in Uncle Buck. Yeah, no. Uncle Buck's a great movie. Uh, Uncle Buck is a great movie. Under, like... Probably one of the most underrated John Hughes movies. And uh, I, I like him in The Page Master, even though I don't think The Page Master is great or anything. I enjoy The Page Master. Mm-hmm. And also, his character is like, has like the same mannerisms and like is just super similar to his character in The Page Master. So that I was like, this is just the same guy, except he's acting worse. Yeah. Uh,. Yeah, so basically, uh, there's also uh, Griffin Dune, who is... Uh, is it Dune or Dunn? I, th- I think it's Dunn. I just always accidentally call him Dune because it reads Dune. that way. Uh, he uh, he plays uh, Veda's like teacher. Teacher that she wants to fuck. Yeah, she, she's like 10. Yeah, she really wants a Which, piece of him. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I don't like the way that they handled that little arc in the movie. They, how they don't do it at all? How they don't handle it? They just kind of go, Yeah. I have, a, I have a wife. I've got a wife. It's like, no, don't don't like explain to her at all that uh, it's like the age and it would never happen regardless of if you had a wife. But He's just like, yeah, if I didn't have a wife, I'd... There's like... A scene where she like returns to the creative writing class, and this scene made me laugh my ass off because she's like comes in, and this is like after she had been absent for like a week or so, I if I'm remembering correctly, and uh, she like goes down like the line of desks, and every dude who is sitting there like gives her a hug, and every woman just like puts an arm on her shoulder, and then she goes up to like uh, Griffin Dunn at the front who. Gives her, like, the big hug, and it's like... That was creepy. I'm like... Why did she hug every single guy? Like, that seemed a little unnecessary. If if I was in that creative writing class, I would not hug that girl. I'd be like, yeah, you're... Be encouraged. Like, definitely, like, be a writer. Can we also talk about how she got into the adult writing class? We can in a second. Hold on, we gotta take a break. I, where's my mouse? Hold on. Be right back. And we're back. Yeah. Just like that Just movie like with that. the dinosaurs. Have you seen that one? Yeah, when I was a little kid. I heard it's bad. I couldn't speak for its quality because nice. I was extremely young when I watched it. Anyway, we were talking about how Veda just kind of... So she's... Uh... She's a nerd. Uh, the first interaction she has with her teacher, they're on summer break, and she goes, I already finished all the summer reading! And he's like, it's been a week, what are you talking about? What the fuck? And she's like, what should I do now? And now I'm reading... War she, and Peace. War and Peace for fun! And he's like, what about you, Thomas Jane? And he's like, I haven't started yet. Which I'm like, that's much more reasonable. Yes. <laughs> And he's like, well, you better get started. I'm like, why? It's the first week. You just fucking scrutinized Veda for finishing all her books. And then they're like, hey, you need to, it's only been a week. You can't do that. And he turns to Thomas J. And he's like, how many have you read? Zero. Hey, you can't do that either. Yeah. Somewhere in between the two of you, there's the right answer. Now find it. But he's he's teaching a creative writing class for adults. It's $35, and Beta steals money from Jamie Lee Curtis's character to attend it. Yeah. And then they don't bring up that $35 until 
very end of the movie. Yeah, until like the third act. And it's like, you think that would come up sooner. You think you seeing would think that how Jamie she Lee's lives in Curtis, an RV? You would think she would have counted her money. Yeah, you would think so. But I guess not. And uh, also, that was just out of character for Veda. Like, I don't think she would steal from, like, this person. I... Especially at that time. Maybe later on, because... So, the whole plot revolves around Jamie Lee Curtis and Dan Aykroyd falling in love. Yeah, that's that's my big problem with the movie. I felt like they focused too much on that instead of the actual, yes. like, interesting stuff of Veda. I agree. Because um, then it just becomes, oh, I, get it. I have to suffer through this generic plot line where I'm watching my dad rekindle his love life. And after. it's not even good. Yeah, like, it's, it's, it's poorly written. I, like, most of the scenes were just... You don't ever learn anything about either of the characters, except... They Dan broke up. Dan Aykroyd plays the tuba. Yeah, and, and apparently he used to be a real happy guy, but now he's not. And then he just randomly beats up a guy. Yeah, I I, I took that scene back because when I first saw it, I'm like, that guy was an asshole, but he didn't deserve to get like assaulted by Dan Aykroyd. But uh, he like grabs Jamie Lee Curtis on the li- wrist, and she's like, "Ow, oh, that hurts." Uh-huh. Which or I. I didn't catch that, like, the I first time I was watching it, so I was just like... So, I, I stand kind of in the middle. I don't know if I would have, like, decked the guy in the stomach, but I definitely would, probably would have, like, smacked his wrist and be like, Hey, don't fucking touch this person on my property. <laughs> Maybe don't Get out. threaten to murder someone. Yeah, like that does too. immediately after. And then her uncle leans over and he's like, He's a real savage. And it's like, is that a good, is that a good thing? It's just like... It, I think there are way too many useless characters in the movie that are just randomly there. Like, I don't think the brother should have been in the movie at all. Yeah, like... I don't... I honestly don't really think that... The, like, the most... Effects... I don't really think that the ex, ex did anything except, like, move their love plot along, which I don't think should have been, like, the main focus at all. Yeah. There there are times where I'm just like, I kind of just wish Jamie Lee Curtis wasn't in this movie. Like, not because she's bad or anything, just because, like, if she wasn't in it, it could have been a more interesting dynamic. I think it would have been, like, because she comes in the movie and she's the one who starts addressing that, like, hey, you know, they're, they're, Veda's not normal. Like, you yeah. should really look into that. And I think that if they had, like, stuck to that approach, like, maybe instead of Oh, we're, I'm gonna fall in love with. Maybe you. they were just friends. Yeah, maybe if she just literally worked there, maybe grew a friendship with the family and was genuinely. Why the fuck did she fall in love with Dan Aykroyd? Because he could play that tuba, and she was just like, "Man, and I want to play her my to tuba." Bingo. <laughs> yeah, bingo at church. There's just a lot of really stupid shit in the movie. Like, I like Veda's character, and I like her and Macaulay Culkin's, like, relationship, even though he sucks in the movie. Yeah. But it's just, like, the creative writing classes were, for the most part, pretty stupid. Okay. My biggest problem with any scene with the creative writing class, because I'd say the creative writing class, with the exception of that, like, final poem she gives, was, like, mostly fucking pointless. And she could... They could have gotten to that conclusion through, like, a different means. Like, maybe... Like, she comes back from school over the summer and writes the poem or something, but... Instead, we have, like, two to three scenes where she goes to this creative writing class. And any time that happens, it comes to a screeching halt because those stupid fucking hippies. Rhonda and her boyfriend. Yes, oh my god. Uh, hold were... on, let me, let me open my notes. I wrote a note about this. <laughs> just every time one of them would talk in the movie, I was just, like, rubbing my forehead in frustration and just, oh gosh. Oh, I said, Rhonda's poem makes me want to fucking die. Yeah, little girl home. walks into the class and, and she's like, I want to read my poem. And he, she's, like, literally like, I don't want to fuck you. Yeah, she's like, flesh on flesh. flesh on flesh. And I'm just like, what the fuck? 
Yeah, and then Vader reads her little poem about, like, fucking Rocky Road ice cream. Oh, back to when uh, they were in the RV and they found... Uh, the reason she got the money is yeah. Shelly lives in an RV. And Thomas oh. J wanted a fucking cookie. Yeah, Thomas J... That she's showing them around, uh, Veda and Thomas J. And Thomas J sees a cookie jar. He's like, oh, I want a cookie. And he opens it. And he pulls out a giant wad of cash. And <laughs> this the isn't funny, a cookie. Yeah, and the funniest line ever. He says, hey, where are all the cookies? <laughs> now that was a good line. He had a couple oh. good... There was like another line of his that I remember laughing at. But I don't remember what it was. Oh. Is that part where Also, um, the narration that Veda did for the most part. N- Veda would narrate over some of the scenes every once in a while. I thought it was bad for the most part. I did think that, like, right after one of those scenes, she says, I'm afraid I I killed my mother. Yeah, that's that I thought was good. Yeah. Like, I, I was like, what the fuck? Like, I was not expecting her to say something like that. And that was, like... and But I feel like they didn't really need to do it in narration. Like, yeah. she could have just said that, or she could have, like, wrote it down or something. Because, like... Because having all that narration, it makes sense that she says that doing narrating. But if you took it all out, all the narration out would probably make it a better movie, and you would just have to put that in somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but basically the entire second act is just her, you know, in the creative writing class and then her dealing with uh, trying to cope with this relationship that her father is forming with Jamie Lee Curtis. And then the third act starts. The third act starts. uh, Probably when Macaulay Culkin dies. You could argue it might start a little bit. So somewhere in the second act, uh, she goes into the woods with Macaulay Culkin and they like hit a hive down or some shit but she loses her ring okay hold on hold on here here, i just remembered something that pissed me off about the movie so yeah when she initially drops her ring uh they're like throwing rocks at a beehive and it falls down and then the bees come out and they run and she forgets her ring and then uh basically her and macaulay culkin like kiss because she's curious about kissing, and then they, like, make the promise, like, you know, hey, Veda, if you don't end up, you know, hooking up with the teacher, would you consider me? And she's like, yeah, I'll consider it. And, you know, that that makes him real happy. It's a real heartwarming scene. And then he goes back to later find to find the ring. And kicks the yeah, and he kicks the fucking bee's nest. Like, and granted, it, it, it's like a couple days later or whatever when he goes back to find Rain. Because uh, they don't, like, go back immediately. Like, the whole, like, kiss thing, I think, took place, like, the day after she lost the Rain or whatever. Day or two, yeah. Yeah, um, and then... And... But he he just goes up and kicks the beehive, and it's like... And then, the, like, nothing comes out right away. And he, like, finds the ring, and then suddenly bees are swarming him. He's like... And, <gasps> then, and then he doesn't run... <laughs> he just kind of flails around and then dies. Yeah, and then they do that dramatic shot where that, his glasses. That was hit my the biggest ground. problem with the film. I don't think they need. I don't think killing him even added to the story very much. Like I don't. Uh, like I, just, I think it. I think it, I think the way they did it was just so poorly done that it didn't add anything. Like, I think there was a way to do it properly. It just wasn't that one. Yeah, I, I, I like the idea of it. Like, I like that this big death happens, especially to somebody so young, someone who has there a hard time. There was too many of them. But the way that they would, they could have gotten to that point by a different route that probably would have been much better. Uh, they didn't have to fucking have it be him being stupid. I'm gonna kick the bees, and they could have properly built it up with a second act that wasn't just fucking Dan Aykroyd and Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah, like, and that's where most of my problems will fall. Like, it's just, I think everything's just kind of poorly executed. Like, 
Like, I like the idea of the film, and I like some of the sequences, but it's just like, and I like Veda. But it's like, ooh. And I do like the character of the teacher. I just think most of his scenes are kind of bad. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, so... The overview of the plot real quick, because we're, our, our, we're, our talk is kind of disjointed. We'll oh, go on these man. weird tangents. So, real quick. We'll get back. Unfiltered. Here we go. Beginning. Yeah, character setup. You meet all the characters. You, you meet get, everybody. You get introduced to their gimmicks. Uh, moves as Jamie Lee Curtis starts working there. Uh, Veda's sad and a hypochondriac, and every time somebody dies, she was like, oh, I must be dying. And she's friends with Thomas J. Second act. It's Dan Aykroyd and Jamie Lee Curtis fall in love, and Veda fucking hates it. And she is... Oh, God! Okay, we'll, we'll go, and then I have, a, I, ha- I have to come back to this. But <laughs> um, And then third act, Macaulay Culkin dies, and Veda has to deal with his death, and he she confronts her dad and be, is like, did I kill my mother? Stuff like that. There's some pretty good scenes in the third act, even though like the setup for the third act was poorly done. And then it ends with her going to the creative writing class, being hugged by a bunch of old men, and then put saying a poem that I actually did enjoy. Like I, I enjoyed the last poem. And then instead of ending it on the poem, they ended on <laughs> her talking about how Reagan was uh Reelected, and how that's good. Yeah. So uh, there's also one other point that it's it's pretty minor. Like it it has an effect on like the tone of the ending, but like uh, in the first act, uh, they set up like there's this, like this small group of girls that kind of walk by and make fun of Beta because she's kind of a tomboy. Uh, oh, yeah. And there's like the one girl who kind of like you can. Is very obviously like looking at her with sad eyes. Like, mm, you know, I don't really agree with my friends when they make fun of you, but I'm not going to say anything. And she I'm just kind of like, the table, you're going to break oh, her recording. S- I keep s- seeing little spikes. I'm going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, and then in the third act, after Thomas J dies, that one little girl is like, "Well, now I can be your Thomas J." Yeah, she's like, "Well, fuck." I guess I'll be your friend now that you've got zero instead of just one. <laughs> you always gotta have one. Yeah. But were you gonna bring up like the carnival or something? Uh, yeah, I was gonna bring up the bumper car scene. Because that's my least favorite scene. That in the scene entire makes film. That, that scene made no sense to me either, because like they get in and Jamie Lee Curtis like gets this like look after a couple times she's, she's bumped. Like, why are you bumping me? And I'm with like, this it's car? literally bumper cars. Why are you getting pissed? Like the daughter <laughs> and the daughter's like, I'm gonna get and I'm like, this is so stupid. Like, that made me literally so angry. Like I had problems with other scenes and but that was that was the worst part. Yeah, no, that that part was really stupid. I remember like thinking that myself where I was just like, What the like, cause I realistically, if you and me Went to the carnival and got in the bumper cars. Mm, I'm probably only gonna aim for you unless some other like little fuck hits me with their car. And then you're like, "Oh, you want? All right, you just open the gate." But typ- typically, I would probably just try ruthlessly attacking people that I know. Yeah, that's what you do in bumper cars. Exactly. I don't bump some random stranger. That seems rude. Yeah, that that's where it gets a little like, who the fuck is this guy who keeps just ran like because like every time him? I've been on bumper cars, it's people I know bumping me or like some like weird little like five year old. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's you know standard for five year olds. They're like, I'm gonna get you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On my notes, I said I hate the bumper car scene. Also, they randomly, Veda randomly calls uh, Thomas J. the R word. I remember I was just that. like, what the fuck? Uh, I'm just going to go through my notes real quick. Oh, yeah. Um, Jamie Lee Curtis and Dan Aykroyd decide to get married after, I think, probably like two months. Yeah, gross. It's not very, and I, I wrote, did I miss a time skip or some shit? Or are these two full grown adults? Who both know the burden of losing a loved one, 
are they really getting married after barely knowing each other for any time at all? Uh, I also wrote, oh, this is a good one. Did they really just kill off the nerd? In reference to Thomas J. I, I figured. I couldn't think of any other nerds who died in the movie. Uh, um, yeah, and then my final thoughts I wrote down. I said, I like Veda as a character and enjoy the interactions with Thomas J, but I don't really like the father or Shelly as characters and think the focus shifts onto them too often. Which is what you said, and I think that I think that for too much of the film, both Shelley and Harry just kind of ignore the feelings of Veda and don't have any character progression or growth looking at them as a family, instead choosing to use the death of Thomas J as a catalyst to push all the character growth into the last half hour of the film. Yeah. Like Shelley like says a couple things in the beginning, but it's not even used as like character growth for her or Veda. It's used as a catalyst to be like, oh, maybe we should fuck. Yeah, like, the only points in, like, the second act where she really, like, does anything that where it's like, okay, I can maybe get, like, behind this. But even then, it still falls into the generic kind of, like, step-parent plot, which is, like, uh, the scene where she, like, puts makeup on Veda, or the scene where, like... I hate this. Veda, uh... Oh, after she puts the, the eyeshadow on, yeah, she goes outside, and Thomas J's like, you lip bleeding? And I <laughs> thought, I like that one. <laughs> I also like the part after she, like, uh, has her first period where she, like, pushes Thomas J, and she's like, don't come back for five or seven, seven days. days. Yes, that was a good one. Yeah. So, it's just, I... I wanted to like this movie a lot more. Yeah. But I unfortunately I, did not. I feel it. Uh, I wanted to like this movie a lot more too because I liked it a lot as a kid. And unfortunately, the lenses are busted on my uh, rose colored glasses. So. Uh, so, what do we want to give this film a score? Are we going to score this film? Yeah. Or do we want to score them? You want to score it first? Yeah. I gave this film a four out of ten. It's pretty good. I, 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 I went with a five. No, wow. So, our average is a 4.5 out of 10. So, ah, I love that. I love those, those games <laughs> on my, my mic. Uh, you want to pause before uh, we talk about uh, World of Comico because they got to take the fat piss. Well, you're going to record it. Put it as the, the intermission. No. Yeah, we'll be right back for World of Conico. Woohoo! There it is. Uh, Welcome back to Weemcast. I uh, hope you had a great little break there. Even though it's only been like two seconds. We took ten years off. I'm now an old man. And we're talking about World of Congo. Yeah. Uh, so this was my pick. This came out in 2014. If I remember correctly. Let me check. Let me check a room. But this was direct. This was a Japanese film by Tetsuya. Ah, oh, what was his name? Tetsuya Nakashima. And Thomas, how would you describe this film? Uh, 2014. This film. If any of you out there have seen uh, Twin Peaks, it's kind of like that where. Uh, okay, because I haven't seen Twin Peaks. I, I'm, I'm not going to dive into any spoilers for Twin Peaks in case anyone's curious. Uh, it's just that like uh, they have the similar plots of somebody is disappeared, or in Twin Peaks it's a dead body, mm-hmm. but uh, as they kind of investigate the circumstances in which this person who's no longer is uh, around during you know the investigation, they uncover a really dark side of their lives that was hidden. Uh, I saw a lot of people being like, this is Twin Peaks. Yeah, it's it's basically got the same, like, basic, like, one-sentence synopsis and, like, pure plot, but uh, okay. both Twin Peaks and uh, this movie kind of go into their own separate little rabbit holes where they kind of turn into something else. Kind of. I mean, this that's basically... 
the through line for this whole movie. But this movie is all over the fucking place. It is. This movie is um crazy. I I would say. Yeah. It's it has a lot going on. Uh, so, what were your, like... I overall really liked it. I, I was a big fan. Like, not anything incredible, but I, I really liked, like, the direction. I really liked a lot of the cinematography in the film, and I really thought that the acting was pretty good, um, especially by the main character, even though he's evil. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I really, I really enjoyed the film. What about you? You did not. Uh, I wouldn't say, like, while I was watching I saw, it. I saw your little smirk. He did a little smirk as soon as I said, what about you? We went, oh. Uh, so I, I was enjoying it while I was watching it. And I got to a little over the halfway mark. And I was like, you know, I'm enjoying this. And then basically everything after that point, I started to like, just. It was just a little too bloated for me. Okay. Uh, it was a little too bloated. It was a little too over stylized, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, I and that's where I thought I'm like, I think if our opinions differ on a film, it's going to be on the stylization of the film. Yeah, like I mean, I I thought the movie was like pretty gorgeous for the most part. Like there was a lot of great cinematography. There was a lot of, like, really interesting-looking stuff on the screen. Mm-hmm. But it was really, like, you know, quickly edited, very fast-paced. A lot of it would just, like, snap by. It seems like a film that also you have to be in the right mood for, also. Like, you have to be in the right setting. Like, it's not a film you can just kind of watch whenever. Like, you have to be in kind of the mood for, like, like quick cuts. Like, I, I'm fine with that, you know? Like, yeah, so am I. But I there there are times that I probably would be like, this is too much for me. Like, like if I'm tired, I probably would not want to watch this movie. Yeah, and there is this, uh, the B plot in the movie, because uh, it would show the, like, uh, like current date at the time. Yeah, the, the film and also- then it would flash back to, like, three months before. And every time it flashed back to three months before, uh, that whole plot, I thought, was fucking pointless. Oh, okay. Uh, like, I get what it... I think I get what it was trying to convey. Like, that the character, Kaneko... Is evil. Is evil. Like her father. But I had already fucking gotten that by the time they wrapped that plot up. And I was just like, you know... Okay. Uh, it's just... it. It didn't go anywhere. I felt like it didn't have any, like, greater impact on the story. Uh, I thought they did a fine job. Like, okay. We're just diving into, like, spoilers. Yeah, we're just diving into spoilers. Okay, so... Basic plot first, or...? Yeah, let's start with the basic plot. Because it's kind of a lot. So if we go over the basic plot, like, the whole thing real quick. That's probably the best way to tackle this movie. Okay, so the movie... It takes place... Um, the main character's name is... Akikazu Fujishima. Fujishima. Um, he's looking his, He's looking for a daughter, Kanako, who's a high schooler. He's like a um, security guard? He's a security he, guard that used to be a... detective Yeah, he's an ex-detective. Um, and she's been missing for... Days, or something. yeah, like six days, and six the mother days. finally like gets in contact with her, and it's literally just the movie's him looking for her and him realizing that she's like not the girl that he thought she was, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, like she's oh god, she did drugs. Oh god, she oh, and it's like much worse than you think. Yeah, it it's so she had a boyfriend in eighth grade named uh. Was it Ogata? Ogata? Ogata, I think. I'm not entirely sure how the pronunciation on that would be. Uh, sorry if I slaughtered it. Uh, who killed himself. Uh, and... Yeah, see, I'm, I'm, I'm debating what, like, what to give away and when. Because there's a lot going on. And the film is very just... Snapping, dropping... Fucking 
little information bombs on you at different points. Uh, but basically, he is abducted by this gang where he's basically like trafficked off to sleep with old men and uh, he kills himself. Yeah. Like, uh, and that's not really revealed until a little later. Um, yeah. When he finds out. Because she does it to another guy. Yeah, and that's the only, like, reason why the B-plot worked, like, at all for me, but I felt like they probably could have done that differently. Like, definitely trimmed it down. I don't know. I thought I it went really on for like, too long. I think a lot of the... I really like the that main guy, the narrator. I really like his monologue, like, a lot. So maybe that's why I like the flashback scene so much. I really like the music choices for those scenes. Yeah, there's and I one really song. like the like his monologues and it's like weird and kind of creepy, but also like really romantic. And I just I, I think that those just kind of make the scenes like work really well. See, I think the reason why I feel so like conflicted about it is because I did like a lot of those scenes when I was initially watching yeah. them, but like once the movie was over, I was like, you know, that took up. A decent runtime of the film, and I felt like after a certain point in the movie, they became. I don't know. It just it 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 wasn't my bowl of cherries, you know. Yeah, I I, I get it, kind of. <laughs> uh, I let's see. Like I'm trying to like articulate like what about it, because. Yeah, I just, it it didn't really amount to much to me outside of, like, the information that, oh, yeah, she's a, a bad person who's getting other people involved, which becomes apparent with, like, two other characters, because there's the one girl who he's interrogating at the beginning, who's, like, a druggie, and he's like, oh, you got my daughter into drugs, and, and it turned out to be vice versa. Yeah. And then there's also, uh, the, uh, all right, major spoiler here, because this relates to the end of the movie, but uh, she ends up getting the her teacher's young daughter into the whole sex trafficking and the drugs. When she was, like, 14. Yeah, so, something like that. And uh, the teacher, spoiler, is the one that kills Conoco. Yeah. And, uh... Yeah, so um, hmm. like I, I like I I like the B plot because I feel like a lot of it threw me for loops on who killed her. Like I because I was like, yeah, this guy killed her, obviously. But I thought like I don't know. I just like how it handled, and I thought that there was like some genuine twists in the film that I enjoyed, and I think that. Those were elevated by the B plot, and even if the B plot was just there just to serve as like a misdirection, and yeah, uh, like I'm fine with it because I think they were handled really well. Like those were some of my favorite scenes, and because of that, and because they handled like the misdirection well, I think I'm okay with it. Like I'm more okay with it than you are, at least. Yeah. Ah. Uh, um, but this film is. I just want to say that like. It's really crazy. Like, it's it's a pretty serious film, but there's also a lot of, like, comedic elements. It reminds me a lot of, like, honestly, like, a South Korean film. Like, yeah. or, um, and I was, I was thinking about this when I was watching it, but it reminded me a lot of a film like Old Boy, if Old Boy was directed by Sion Sono who is a Japanese director who makes a lot of crazy films that are great. <laughs> uh, but if anyone's seen any Sion Sono films, especially like Tokyo Tribe or uh, even like Anti-Porno, like a lot of the colorization stylizations are like very similar to that. Um, oh yeah, we were doing the basic plot. Yeah, so, yeah, the plot's all over the place. So basically... Uh, he starts, like, he starts by interrogating some of the students, 
the teacher, the teacher, the mother, uh, her psychiatrist, her psychiatrist, which is played by a a very good actor. Can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he's in the he's like plays the old Japanese man in the South Korean movie called The Whale, which is a fantastic film. Hmm. But back to back to that. Yeah, so he starts interrogating people. And what does... How does he find the first, like, clue? Uh, what was the first clue? I don't Hold on. I'm looking it up. I think it's mostly, like... I mean, I don't think he really even finds a lot of clues in the film. Like, a lot of it is, like, him being stupid. Yeah. Um, and it's only, like, eventually the Yakuza find him. Yeah, because if, if that scene didn't happen, he wouldn't have figured it out. Because that's where he gets the... Or, no, he... Okay, I, I remember, because he gets the pick... He gets, like, the fucking deposit box... Where he, he finds yeah. the pictures, and in one of the pictures, he eventually recognizes uh, one of the girls in one of the pictures as uh, the teacher's daughter, which is what leads him to, you know, eventually yeah. figure so that out. But What happens, though, is, like, a bunch of people are dying. Um, the, the film opens with three people, like, in a grocery store or a convenience store dying, and they're connected to the Yakuza. And he thinks Conoco's connected and everything's all sports. So, like, what the fuck's happening? Yeah. Um, and eventually the Yakuza come after him because those pictures he'll eventually find, or he might have already found them at the time, uh, they were secretly taken by Conoco. And they had, like, all the men that were sleeping with underage girls, including, like, the Yakuza boss. So, obviously, she had a death. Uh, <coughs> Mark on her head. Um, so they're looking for her. Her, like, one of the guys she was rolling with, Matsunaga or something like that? Uh, yeah. Matsunaga. That's Matsunaga. It. He's, like, this super edgy guy, uh, and he was, like, the person that, like, got um, her original boyfriend, like, raped and stuff. Yeah. Um, but... And he he's, like, madly in love with her, too, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. And she was using him. Too, and it's just like just like everyone but else the yakuza yeah the yakuza took him and they were like torturing him and he was like bloody everywhere and i'm like this is a high school <laughs> yeah and like there he had his intestines like exposed yeah. and they were like stomping on it it was fucking intense I'm like what the fuck <laughs> oh this movie like dials it up to 11 in some scenes like it's crazy Keep saying it's crazy because those are my main yeah. Thoughts so uh, <laughs> after uh, Matsunaga basically like lets him in on some uh, dude in the police department who's like working with like the that gang and like in the child prostitution rings mm -hmm. and uh, so then they send the main guy. What's his name? Aki's, uh, Ozzy Q? What, what's his last name? I remember his last name. Fujishima. Fujishima. Aki Kazu. Aki Kazu. Okay. Well, they send him to, like, take, like, hold his family hostage or something, and, uh, he ends up doing... Then he tells, uh, oh, yeah, he, he, he rapes the guy's wife. Yeah, that's, There's... that's the point in which I was like, uh, this guy's a monster. Like the the guy's a monster. They he, he, also, he definitely teeters. Like he's definitely like a monster. The rest of the movie, but, but that's that's the point where there's and then no it, and then it's revealed that they like fuck Conoco. Yeah, him. and it's like oh yeah, but Conoco was also a monster in that situation. Yeah, because like, when you start this movie, even though like the dad's a piece of shit, you see the mom's like distressed, and Conoco seems. You know, like a young person probably out partying a lot. Getting in. I think the film builds upon, like, how monstrous they are pretty well. Yeah. Because it's like, obviously, even going to the film, you're like, yeah, some fucked up shit's probably going on. But not nearly to the extent that they, like, it is revealed. 
yeah. in my opinion at least. I wasn't expecting to be like, oh, this young girl pimps out other young girls to old men and fuck for that. Yeah. No. And led people to suicide. This movie had a great soundtrack. Yeah, I agree. I think the soundtrack's good. Like, really, really good. There is one track, I think it's called Gone Away Dream, which is the Dream in my heart. Like that track? Ooh, that was sexy. Oh, thank, thank you. Uh, it's good. Thomas's full cover. You can find it in the description below. Oh, yeah. Uh, 20 bucks. By below, you mean my ass, right? <laughs> yep, that's exactly... Yep, 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 yep. <gasps> Oh. But uh, that track's really good. The only uh, part of the soundtrack where I would like cringe is whenever they would play House of the Rising Sun, but I'm biased because I just fucking hate that song. I don't mind the song. I okay, think it I, for the film. I don't think it's like a bad song, it's just it's overexposure. Over yeah, but I, usually in like Asian cinema, I'm just like, it's fine. Whatever. Yeah, they they don't have, they I'm probably like, they, aren't they as probably overexposed yeah. over there as like, we are over here. <laughs> I, I actually had a similar thought to that when I was watching this movie because that, that led me on the trail. I'm like, I wonder if there are any like Japanese songs that are like usually put in movies over here that we just pay no mind to. But like, I wonder if there, any of them are like really popular songs in Japan that if like a Japanese person came over and watched the movie, they'd be like, fuck, why did they use this fucking song? But I'm, I'm sure there are probably fucking cases of that. Yeah. Actually, maybe not. I, you don't see a whole lot of uh, Japanese tributes in big American movies. Because we love America. Well, we also love China. Same things. True. A lot of our movies cater towards the Chinese audience as well. Yeah. And we also love uh, money. Uh. Yeah, no, that's, that's the main reason. Why I feel like uh, we try to appeal to China so much because they got the they got the ticket sales over there that we don't. It's a lot of there. people. Oh. Supposedly, like that's why I'm pretty sure that's the reason why they keep making Transformers movies because there was a point where they yeah. well, and that's why it was so sad. Bumblebee did pretty bad over there. Yeah, because it was less accurate. Apparently, it was Star Wars movies that would do too well over there. Either. Because unfortunately, the it's racism, unfortunately. Uh, they like... Like, they hated Black Panther. Yeah. Uh, apparently... Uh, Sorry, mainstream... I don't like just saying they. A lot of mainstream Chinese audiences did not enjoy Black Panther. Yeah. Uh, fucking... What was I just about to say? A lot of, like, the movies that tend to do, like, really well over here, or over there, from over here, are, like, the ones that don't have like a whole lot of complicated dialogue but lots of really big action scenes. Yeah. Like Michael Bay usually does pretty good over Yeah. Um, okay. Back to uh World of Conoco though. Yeah. So literally the He's fi- trying to find his daughter. His daughter's been dead the entire time, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and it's by somebody he doesn't even know about until like pretty much the very end of the film. And he talks to the teacher in the first Well, he act. talks to the teacher in the first act. Being like, hey, do you know where she is? And she's like, I don't know. She's a good student, though. And she's a liar. Uh, but he gets into this shootout with uh, the the guy. Yeah. Um, that that was probably the best scene of the whole fucking Yeah, movie the, it's movie. a really fun action scene. Um, uh, although I do have gripes with that scene. Because uh, they keep... The, you know what that scene reminded me of? The shootout in the good, the bad, the weird. Because they just keep like shooting yeah. each other. I'm, I was like, I was in love with that scene. Uh, fucking. Are people just indestructible over there to cars? Because in that scene alone, two people got hit with a car. And it's not like a, you know. They got like 10 hit. miles per hour bump with the car. Probably like, like they, 50. Yeah, no, the car is, like, pedal to the metal, and just, the one dude literally gets launched in the fucking air. And then he's fine, yeah. Yeah, and he gets up, and he's just like, 
I because of how cartoonish that whole scene was, I was kind of fine with it. Like after that, I was like, yeah. "This is fine." But because just, like, like because the movie teeters like from like being like this super serious like crime drama about like this and in the third two. act, it just totally like, like hit the tone switch and yeah. was just like. All right, here's the live action cartoon for a couple. And then, scenes. and then it happens again that it gets like super serious, and it's like, yeah, and then it's just for the very last scene, he's like, all right. Which I don't. I think because the movie was just so stylized throughout the whole thing, I was fine with the tone shifts. I thought they worked. I did not. Uh, that's good. It's good to disagree. I hate you. Um, that's fine. <laughs> but I don't know. I really like the movie. Uh, oh. And then, and then he does figure out that it was the teacher, and he like goes to her and he's like, "Where's my fucking daughter?" And beats her up, and then the the movie ends with him like forcing her to like she's out in the snow, just like digging. She's like, "I can't fucking find her body. There's snow everywhere." He's like, "You're gonna do it. You will not stop shoveling until you find her." And I I really like the ending. And then the film like. Ends. Doesn't it end where he's like, she's not really dead. She can't be. I have to kill her myself. And then he's basically like sulking and then credits roll. Pretty much. Yeah. Because like his entire movie's like, I have to kill her myself. She and did. She teased me for wanting to sleep with her. I have to kill her. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I mean. And then earlier on, uh, it's revealed that, that that main guy in it had died. Like he was going to try to kill Tonto. And then she just killed him. Or yeah. she has another guy kill him. Somebody killed him. Yeah, uh, it's the same, whoever it is that does kill him, it's the same person who killed the uh, people in the convenience store in the beginning of the movie. Because... Which I think it was Matsunaga. Or somebody with them. Because yeah. that's why that's why he got killed. It, it looked like he was like a big beefy guy, whoever it was. So. Uh, but yeah, no, the same, the same like, kind of like silhouetted guy. Is the dude who you see like in the quick cuts in the beginning when they're showing like the people dead in the convenience store? Uh, he just comes up and uh, you know sh- stabs him in the jugular and uh, he bleeds out and uh, yeah, that's the end of uh, that guy from the B plot. Uh, yeah, so that's the basic plot of the film. Yeah, it's it's pretty convoluted, but I personally thought it worked well. Like. I definitely, like, I won't say I didn't enjoy the movie. Like, I enjoyed watching it. But just, as a whole, I felt like it didn't mesh together well enough for me. And I don't know if I'll necessarily be itching to rewatch it anytime soon. But, uh, there there were scenes that had me, like, I, and I the, styl- the stylization I thought was overboard. But there were scenes where I thought it worked. I think that it was just on the edge of being overboard for me at least like i love the stylization but i like get that it was like i feel like we're like right on the edge of the same line we're just on other sides of it like i was like oh it was just enough it was just almost too much and you're like it was just too much yeah (laughs) which is what i kind of expected but like every scene has like tons of quick cuts there's a ton of like symbols that appear on the screen there are a couple times where it will, f- like, switch to animation for a couple, like, seconds. Usually when, like, the main narrator, like, jumps in a pool. Yeah. And I, I love those scenes. I'm like, whoa. The opening credits to the film is, like, this animated... Kind of reminds me of, like, a James Bond. It reminds me of, uh, like, uh, kind of like the good, the bad, and the ugly. Like, uh, I know you haven't seen that. You've seen it's fucking South Korean remake. I've seen the though. South Korean remake. It's probably better because that song came home. You know, I'm just kidding. I love Song K and uh, And I really like that. The good, the I don't movie. think it's... I, I'm sure the original's good. I've heard the original's amazing, so... I, I really like it. But... Yeah, I love... Oh, there's a couple... I do have some notes on some of the shots that I really love. Um... There's a girl in it called uh, named Endo. Um, she runs with Konako and Matsunaga. Um, oh, is, is she, she has like a scar on her face later on? She like yeah, she's a bully. She's she's a dickhead. Yeah, she um, deserves what but, she fucking yeah, gets. Yeah, she gets um, the main narrator 
like fucking beats her with a baseball bat <laughs> and like cuts, cuts her, her off. Yeah. And, uh, and then she kills herself after that, right? Or help. She does kill herself. There's there's a scene where she jumps off a roof. Um, oh, okay. um, I don't, but I don't there's there's that. a scene. Um, it's an extra wide shot, and it's her back, and it's snowing, and the cityscapes right in front of her. Oh, is that like right in the beginning of the movie? Yeah, they're like okay, they're, yeah, they're, yeah, they're yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's like, what about the other people that she ran with? And he's like, oh, uh, she's fucking. Um, and then she jumps, and I fucking that's a. Gl- I think that shot was gorgeous. I love that shot. Yeah, well, the uh, the opening shots of the movie were really nice. Uh, I really um, liked a lot of the openers, like opening shots, like the snow. I liked the lighting and the scenes where they have like the people, like the "I love you, I'm gonna fucking kill you." And then it keeps, like, flashing to, like, the parties. Um, earlier on, he also rapes his, his ex-wife. Uh, yeah, that's I forgot about that. But it's a lot of fucking it's, rape It's, in it's, it's an intense film. Like, be, be warned. If you're not good with that, then I wouldn't recommend watching it. Like, I enjoy the film a lot, but it's, it's fuck up. But it's... I... It cuts back to... Um, when he found out she was cheating on him. Um, mm-hmm. And I really love the cinematography of those shots, too. So, like, in between the, this, like, horrific rape scene, it's cutting to this, like, really beautiful cinematography of this, like, snowy night. And I'm like, ah! Um... Oh, shit. And then... Right when he gets captured by the Yakuza, right before that, he's, like, exploiting a young girl who had been out, like, drinking underage. He's, like, he, like, exploits her to go have oh, sex with yeah. her. And then she gets shot in the head. And yeah. I was, like, big... Not before she's, her. like, shot... Yeah, she's, like, shot in the, the like, torso? Tor- yeah, and she's, like, bleeding out. She's, like, crawling away. Yeah, for, like, the entirety of this, like, scene while the Yakuza are, like, uh, dealing with the main character, she's just in the corner fucking bleeding and in pain and then once that scene ends they go over and they you know do the final shot and kill her and it's like god damn and then he wakes up and she's gone so I'm guessing they took her with her probably but oh and then uh, the narrator Boku uh, that's his name um, there's a scene of him uh, I believe it was right after he got raped um uh He's running, I think, barefoot um, out in the rain, and the camera's, like, on his, like, feet, and the sun's bouncing off the ground, so, like, everything is, like, orange, and I love that shot. Hmm. It's a... I don't remember that particular shot. Oh. Huh. Yeah, but... Yeah. Got any more, like, notes? Uh, that's pretty much it. It's, like, my final note was, it, like, it reminds me a lot of, like, films like Old Boy, but directed by Sion Sono. Also, it reminded me a lot of Prisoners. You've seen Prisoners, right? Yeah. Like, just kind of the same basic concept, too. Yeah. But. Oof. Except, in Prisoners, I would say that, like, Hugh Jackman's character becomes a worse person, like, trying to find his daughter, which is, like, understandable. Yeah. And in this film, it's more revealed that this guy's always been evil, kind of thing. But, but yeah, overall, I do really enjoy. I really enjoyed my time with this film. Um, it has faults, obviously. I don't think it's like incredible, but I really liked it. I had a lot of fun, and then it also was fucking horrific. But I think it teeters the line pretty well, and I don't think it. I don't think it ever glorified any of these evil acts, like. I think they were pretty unforgivingly evil, and the characters were pretty unforgivingly evil, so I think it walks a fine line pretty well, yes. and then it has some great cinematography, and some great uh, music, and some. I thought the acting was pretty superb, especially by the main, I thought that the main character was really fucking good. Fun fact, he's also the main character in The Boy and the Beast. He's the beast in that. He's the voice of that. Uh, did we watch that one subbed? I don't remember. Uh, I think so. But, yeah. 
The bad movie. Yeah, no, I didn't really. <laughs> but I thought that was funny, so I brought it up. Oh, what are your final thoughts? Yeah, like like I said, uh, I wasn't crazy about the movie. I I didn't like love it, but I didn't hate it. I thought it was enjoyable. I think it's worth a watch if you can handle the in- intense uh, things that happen in it. Uh, but I don't know if it's one that I'll be rewatching anytime in the next couple years or maybe ever. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe because I do like the soundtrack, so maybe like I would like to watch some of his other films. Yeah, uh, I was I was I reading Confessions and Kamikaze Girls have been on my watch list for a while, but I've heard most of it. Like pretty much all his films are pretty well received. Yeah, uh, I was reading about some of his other, or I was reading like some stuff on this one and I commonly saw recommendations for his other movies and saying that this one was not the best of his roster, but a lot of people seem to enjoy it. So, um, what, oh, um, also, fun fact, uh, the cinematography was actually done by a guy, um, what's his name? He, he hasn't done very much before. Like, this was one of his first, like, big works. He did, like, a TV movie Ooh. and he did, like, one other thing, but like for the most part, this was like kind of his breakout thing. His name is Sho- Shoichi Otto, and since then, uh, I know you like the the anime or the manga Parasite. Yeah, um, the two live action Parasite films. He oh. did the cinematography for, which are both apparently really good. I've I've seen like clips and stuff from them. Uh, I think the biggest thing keeping me away from watching those or that kept me away from watching those for so long is the CG. I could. Uh, but, but, yeah, I yeah, we'll probably did the watch for that, so I thought that was kind of cool. I couldn't find very much trivia, so. <laughs> um, right, well, what what is what's your, your rating? I gave my rating first for last time. So. Pro- probably a six. six. My, my rating's a seven. Like I said, I really enjoy it. Usually, sevens are things that I really enjoy, but not any. Of that, so that's what I I thought you would give it a six, maybe a seven, but so yeah, our six point five is our our rating. Ta da! All right, all right. So uh, next week we're switching it up. I'll be picking a movie from uh, twenty six years or earlier, and uh, Thomas is doing something in the last twenty five years. So what is your your movie for this week? My movie is directed by David. Robert Mitchell, the director of It Follows. Oh, uh, fuck. Oh, fuck! Yeah, uh, oh! it's a little movie starring Andrew Garfield called Under the Silver Lake. I remember oh. seeing the trailer for this movie like in 2017, uh, back when it was like at Cannes, and then uh, its reception wasn't the greatest from so it got, the audience, yeah, so yeah. it got re-edited and pushed back. I don't know what version of the film was like finally released on DVD. I I really want to see the unedited version because mm-hmm. I had heard some really positive reviews about it too from YMS specifically. Uh, from him specifically, yeah. yes. Uh, mm-hmm. And you know, I I just want to compare. I want to get my own sense um, of a uh, this movie, this episode that you're listening to right now should be out past the date that I believe, if you're watching this, listening to this right now, uh, it should be available on Prime Video if you want to give it a watch. Uh, oh, yeah. The um, it's available. To, no. Uh, oh. Under the Silver Lake, I believe uh, July 1st releases on Prime Video, if I remember reading that correctly. Or I could be bullshitting. Or you can always buy it, or... Yeah. Somehow other get it way. <laughs> yes. Um, my film is... Uh, a co-worker of mine was actually telling me about this. And I I haven't watched any of the films he's recommended me yet. So I thought I'd start with this one. Because it seems strange. And it seems kind of kind of epic. Um, 1962. Directed by a guy named Wesley... Or Wesley Berry. Uh, it's called The Creation of the Humanoids. I've never heard of this movie. Yeah, I, I hadn't either. And he's like, 
it's the greatest movie of all time. I'm like, I don't know about that, but it is available on YouTube if you would like to watch it. Uh, there's a couple of uploaders. The full movie's on there and pretty high quality. Uh, 75 minutes long. I think Under the Silver Lake is only like an hour and a half, so I watch them. I think you know, I just had the page up for it. I think, because I think it's like two hours. Oh, fuck. I can't watch that long of a movie. It is 139 minutes. Oh, that's t- uh, 2 hours and 20 minutes? And let me just say real quick that I think It Follows is a fantastic film. I really love It Follows, personally. I also really enjoy It so, Follows. I am very excited to see this one. And uh, I think that's it for today's episode. Yeah, I think we've covered all the bases. I'm so, sorry uh, this episode wasn't two and a half hours like our Wild Hogs episode. Yeah. Uh, next next week, uh, hopefully we get better at like st- structuring. Structuring. Uh, I think it was a little difficult with, especially with Conoco. So I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah, How Con- do I explain this? Conoco's the, all over the place <laughs> because the film is told through like flashbacks and stuff. So I'm like, uh, what's the best way of tackling this? But anyway, if you like the 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 podcast, don't forget to tell your dad. Yeah. Uh, Listen to your poppy. But if you tell your fucking mom, I'm, I'm sorry, this is a no mom podcast. Yeah, no moms allowed. We're gonna get shirts that say no moms allowed. Only dads. Only weans. <laughs> yeah. Only, only weans. Uh, right. Grandmas are okay too, though. Yeah. They, they, they don't count as moms. Yeah. They're, it's like if you put two negatives together, it's a positive. You put two moms together, like double the mom, that's a grandma, no mom. Yeah. But. Don't go thinking that yeah, great you lesbian moms movie. out there, you don't equal a grandma. So. Only if you listen to it jointly. Like, you put in <laughs> ear, earphones and you have one in. And you have ear. to wear the same shirt. <laughs> okay. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>